Just make sure we're all in the right spots. Hey, y'all. Welcome in. Just checking that we're live in all the right places. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Hey, hey. So if you're just getting in right now, feel free to uh, say hello in the chat box over there. Uh, what's up, Wayne? If you are on the business page, uh, generally speaking, so if you're on our Satori Prime Intuitive Coaching page um, and you want to join more of the stream of conversation that happens, most people tend to watch it inside the Facebook group. So jump into the Old Souls and Seekers group. Hey, Robin. Hey to everybody that's saying hello. Alex, Ritu, what's going on, everybody? So uh, good to have you here. Hope you had a nice weekend. I just got to celebrate my son's third birthday and uh, went to a trampoline park. And I don't know if you've ever been to a trampoline park or when's the last time you jumped on a trampoline yourself. <clears throat> but it kicked my ass and my calves are super, super sore. <laughs> they can barely walk right now, um, which is kind of funny. So, um, yeah, I know we're all kind of starting to head into the holiday season here. Uh, I hope wherever you are, if you are in the States or celebrating Thanksgiving, that you are um, on your way to spend some time with uh, friends and family and enjoying some quality time. So if you are new, very new to the Old Souls and Seekers group, please uh, just let me know in the chat box. Let me know that you're you're new here, I'd love to say hello to you and welcome you in. Usually you get a party or two with myself and my brother. Uh, however, Elon is also on an airplane flying up the East Coast to see um, his wife's family up on uh, the Philadelphia area there as well. Okay, so I wanted to uh, just make a quick announcement before we get into today's training. Wanted to remind you guys again that uh, after the holiday season, as we go into the new year, that um, you are going to see a price hike across the board on all our programs. So if you have been looking to get into level one training with us, uh, know that at minimum, uh, we are going to double the price of that course. Uh, so if you are looking to get in and you want to save yourself some money, make sure that you get in contact with someone from our team or take an application to be in that program uh, before the new year, because come January 1, the programs will be uh, at a higher cost. So again, it's a it's a really, really good time to uh, at least at, at least inquire and find out if you want to be in a program and then decide whether it's a good fit for you. OK, so um, <clears throat> since I'm uh, on my own today, today is uh, going to be an open format as well. So feel free as I'm kind of bringing some stuff through here to um, ask questions and I will take as many of them as appropriate in the uh, hour time frame that we slot for these calls. Um, and today's topic is uh, self-judgment, all right? Like how many how many of us uh, out there, and be honest, you know, inflict pain on ourselves uh, through self-judgment? So I thought it would be an important topic to broach because uh, something that I value greatly uh, in my life and something that I'm always driving towards is, is honestly peace of mind. All right. Like I, I don't know how many of you guys have, uh, some strain of that too. Like one of your top priorities in life is to feel peaceful and have some peace of mind. Let me know in the chat box there if that resonates for you. <clears throat> so what I want to kind of bring through is, um, how can we identify, uh, how can we identify essentially what it is that we're inwardly judging ourselves of because the mind has this uh, extraordinary illusion type of mechanism that it does when it is um, manifesting. And this is actually a lot of the stuff that they are starting to 
not just realize in spiritual circles, but also in um, the quantum physics study of consciousness is this mind's incredible ability to both manifest and then also um, completely convince itself that it is not the source of that manifestation. So there's this like dual paradox that is happening within our minds, which is both the creator and then the thing that's detaching from um, believing that it's created what's arising in our lives. Let me actually just close something real quick here. Okay. And so look, self-judgment uh, at its at its core, right? Of course, um, most of that lineage is going to come from what you saw at home, uh, the lineage you were born into, the kind of rules and assessments that a culture or religion or your parents may have had. And that has set certain standards in your system. You know, like people who tend to be... Um, depressed or very sad at the opposite end of that, you could say that that person actually has extraordinarily high standards for themselves. And so they're living in this perpetuity of never able, never being able to quite meet up to the standards that they have for themselves. And so in that place are constantly finding themselves in disappointment in regret and not feeling like they're good enough. And so there's this perpetuity of this kind of like malaise in their life, right? And um, there's kind of this feeling that if they found their purpose and they found what they were really passionate about, that they would put everything into it, but it always seems like it's just that far out. So I wanted to kind of open with that to give it this different spin, because a lot of times when we look at people in those states, and I have lived in those states, I have felt depressed and have had you know conjurings of suicide and things like that in my life in my teen years for for a long time actually, um, and oftentimes we can look at those people and those people might look at themselves as a victim of their circumstances, as a victim of their uh, reality, as a victim of their emotions. When in fact, that person may have extraordinarily high standards for themselves and extraordinary work ethic, and and again they're just you know they've put that so far out there that they can't meet that. So there are a few things I wanted to talk to you guys about today, two principles here. Um, and the first one is going to be uh, on this principle of um, this thing called excess potential. Okay. Um, well, you know what? Let me back up a step. So first, when we, when we assess what it is that we're judging ourselves, the first thing we want to look at is honestly, like, how are we judging other people? Okay. Because the way that our mechanism works is it will uh, externalize an internal truth onto the world. And so if we stop looking at other people as like these uh, other people out there with, with agendas and ideas, and we start realizing that pretty much each and every one of us, not pretty much, each and every one of us is living in our own set of reality. Meaning that if I was to go around and ask people in a room to give their opinion about me, I'm going to get a lot of different variations on who I am because every single person is going to see me, my persona, my individuality, and all my things through the filters, belief system, judgments that they grew up around. And so it's just going to skew their view of me just a little bit. And then we can get into an argument about who's right and who's wrong about their view. But the truth is that every person's view would be completely accurate from the point of view that they're looking at it from. And so one of the things that, that we've taken on in our lives for many, many years is that this, this concept, this idea that people are not actually responding to you. Okay, so if something is happening in your life, it's causing strife, a fight, anger, whatever, it's like that they're not even doing anything. This is really just your own reflection, your own persona, and your own um, identity in a way, or part of your identity that you keep hidden from yourself, but then you put this identity on others and you will find yourself judging other people in the world for this aspect within yourself that is not right or wrong. It's just incomplete. And what it means to be incomplete is it just means that at some point in time, there was some kind of trauma, some kind of distortion, some kind of confusion, something that happened in the system. And in that moment, you took this aspect of yourself, right? This thing, whatever it might be, whatever this trauma might be, and you separated it from yourself. And you start looking at it as if it's an object 
outside of yourself. And then the mind quickly convinces you that you are not this way. And so it will then convince you that others are this way. And in order to resolve this within yourself, you need to resolve this for them. So then you become a person that either tries to, um, you know, like fix this aspect in other people or convince them to be some other way. And this is kind of what we're doing time and time again. So a, an immediate indicator for you should be, and maybe a question you might, might want to ask yourself right now is, is like, what are the persistent judgments I have of other people? What are the things that really piss me off about society? What are the complaints that I consistently have about the way things are going or the way people are? And then again, to relationship, and I find people like that. I get into a workspace and I find that uh, my, you know, the people who have authority over me have these qualities and you want to start looking for what is this pattern? Again, what is this, this persistency, this consistent complaint that I have about other people, about society and so on and so forth. And if you write this down, it'll help you just to kind of evaluate it outside of yourself. Okay. And now for most people, it is going to be very confronting then, right? It's going to be very confronting to say, you know what? No, I am that way too. Okay. And the way that you can look for this, again, because this is, again, your mind is programmed around hiding this from you. And so you almost have to, I'm putting this in quotes because it's not true, like trick your mind into seeing this aspect of yourself. Because the truth is, we all have every aspect that a human being can be. If like if there is a, a human imagining it, there's a human out there doing it, right? It's like we are completely unlimited in our capacity as human beings. If we can imagine something, we can do that something, right? And so you have to imagine that if if you can even imagine it, there is some human being out there probably already doing it, okay? And so you want to look for evidence. You want to cultivate this practice of looking for evidence of when you have been that way. Like if you re get really annoyed or, re you know, really upset when other people are angry and you think to yourself, well, I'm not an angry person. I promise you, if we evaluated it and we looked for evidence, whether in your relationships or with your children or uh, in a workspace or when money was tight or when you were on some kind of substance or drunk that you found yourself in a situation where you exuded anger. And so this personality trait came out of you. Now, maybe that's not your primary and maybe that doesn't come out a lot, but it still lives within you and you want to find examples of this. Okay. Because basically anything that you turn away from in your own system, you don't, you don't have an opportunity to heal. And that's the fundamental aspect of it is that if you don't turn back to it, give it presence, and allow for this aspect of you to heal, then in the avoidance of it, it runs your life. Okay, so think about like how much energy people give to judging other people. Why are you this way? Or needing to heal that in society or whatever it is. And the truth is, is that if you heal that within yourself, then you would not even, it would never upset you. You would never even see that in society. It would cause no disturbance in your system whatsoever. And so if you feel like you are leaking your energy to these judgments, you know, to these persistent complaints, then the quickest way to resolve this is not to fix it in society. It's to actually resolve it within yourself. And the way that we do that is we stop, uh, we reintegrate into the system. Anything that's outside of yourself, you're going to feel powerless to do something about. Okay. So right in that moment of trauma, you put that out here and it's like you start reacting to it like it's an object instead of looking at it, right, within and from within yourself and noticing that there is there's some kind of response happening, both mentally at the level of physicality and at the level of sensation. And if you do that, you can start reintegrating this part back into the system. Some experiences are gonna arise about that, obviously, as you start to notice, oh yeah, I do have these aspects within myself. I do notice the mind state, I do notice this emotional and sensational experience I'm having, right? And through the different practices uh, that we teach here um, at Satori Prime, this is that's what it's all about. It's not about resolving to get rid of something. Like if you think you're ever going to completely get rid of your anger or you're ever going to get rid of your stress and you're never going to experience stress again or loneliness or sadness, in our view, after 20 years of doing this work day in, day out, consistently, nothing goes away. And in any healthy model that I have seen of spirituality, um, we call this an inclusive model.
Okay, so you you transcend and you always include, meaning you're transcending the state that you're in, but you're always including it. In fact, when we do energetic practices with people, we actually have, and, and, and certain aspects of themselves rise up, we call this parts. If the part feels, right, if there's a part of you that feels that it is going to get left behind or that it is no longer going to be needed through this healing practice that you're that we're doing with people, the part actually freaks out and and turns on and actually like starts um, activating and, and using up more energy in the system, meaning it becomes more evident in the system. So we actually consistently remind people as they do healing practices that this aspect of you is in, is coming along with us. We're not going to leave it behind, and it's really important for the, this aspect of you to hear that. Okay, so. Again, this, this first part of it is really like, how do we notice, how do we judge ourselves harshly? And by the way, you can look up all sorts of peer-reviewed studies on how, you know, in certain cultures where they uh, demonize people, maybe for their um, sexuality or different beliefs, whatever it might be, that often the people that are most extreme on those bands, you know, use sexuality, for, for example, like most people who will demonize gay people oftentimes either are gay themselves or have uh, intense gay tendencies within their body, but they grew up in a culture where they couldn't cultivate that, where they were told that they were bad and wrong for that. And so they become, they become the person that basically is the flag bearer for trying to remove that in the world. And the reason for this is really the second thing I want to bring through here, which is fundamentally what everybody, like this is the one thing, whether you agree with anything I say or not, it doesn't really matter to me. But like, if you want to look at fundamentally what everyone is trying to get to in this world, what everyone is trying to achieve at one level or another is we are, we're trying to feel safe, right? Even that person that might be demonizing and, and been demonized for this feeling inside their body by trying to remove that in the world, what they're really trying to do is create safety in their own system. Right. And so whatever side of the issue you're on with everything that's going on in the world today, it's very easy right, to pick a side. And chances are you're going to pick a side based on some past stuff. right? However it is that you were informed to be a good boy or a good girl or a good Samaritan or what your religion told you or what your culture told you, whatever kind of more like what fits better into, their, into those cultural streams for you, you're going to lean to one side or the other and just kind of live in that space and then look right for other biases that would reconfirm that. And again, these are like really well-known psychological aspects of people today. And so what I want to say is like underneath all that though, if you get rid of all these biases and all these things that humanity is going to continue to deal with because that's how our brain functions. And if you're not aware that your brain functions that way, then it is going to take you for a lot of rides. What we can probably find agreement with is that no matter what side of an issue you're on, and just feel in for yourself, like the reason you feel that way, the reason you want that to come to fruition in the world, is chances are is it's gonna you feel or you believe it's gonna make you feel more safe. Okay, how many of you guys know what I'm saying here? Like how many of you guys are tracking this? Like that underneath all of this stuff, it comes back to safety. And I see. Um, Wayne, I know that like you've had some pretty big um, breakthroughs around that recently. Just that, just that recognition, like recognize in your own system right now, if you can, that there is this extraordinary desire to try to create safety, this feeling of safety. Okay. Now we have a lot of different ways that we have tried to achieve this in society. I'll give some basic ones, but like fundamentally on the individual level, safety, right? It's find a partner, somebody that loves me. <laughs> Because then it's like, uh, I'll have someone to take care of me. That's a, a matter of safety. Um, another one is money, obviously, right? Like a big, big one in our society right now is like to care, to care, take yourself, your family and others. Uh, money is currently a requirement or seeming requirement to do that. Some people, by the way, don't feel they need money at all, can feel absolutely safe without it. So that's why I don't want to speak about it in absolutions because, of course, there are differences of opinion even on that. And then so what it often looks like in society or what it has looked like in society for many, many years is that in order for a, a person, an individual to feel safe, we have been led to believe that for safety to be there, that everybody or at least a large portion of the population needs to think like you, needs to feel like you, 
and needs to act like you. Think about all the wars that have been fought. Think about the, the you know, dictatorships and authoritarianisms and monarchs and all these different things where it's like you had to be like the king or you had to be like this culture or if they found another culture that wasn't like this culture, they became oppressive towards that culture until they adopted their ways, right? Like, you know, one of the things that people honor and clap of America about is like it's a smelting pot that people integrate into really, really well, right? Whether that's true or not, that's up for debate. But fundamentally, that's kind of what it's been. It's like, hey, we got to get those people over there to think, feel, and act like I do, and that will make me feel more safe, okay? And then that also binds itself to this, this idea that humans have that if a lot of people agree on something, that it must be true. And so we, we often hang our hats on this. We look for agreement. And this is where biases start coming in and cognitive dissonance starts coming in because from our point of view, again, what's going to make us feel more safe is by finding as many things as possible that confirm our biasy, as many people as possible that confirm our biasy, right? And this is where social media has kind of run amok. And we all know this because it's created these echo chambers where it's actually really easy to confirm your biasy, even though there's just as much data in other pockets that would not confirm your biasy, but the mind immediately will say, well, that must not be true, right? Or completely validate your own truth. So again, this, this might bring up some stuff, right? Like I'm aware, I'm, we're pointing the ego identity and parts don't like when you're pointing at ego identity and parts they are like, Psh, no, couldn't possibly be true. And you can continue to believe that they're not true. That's fine. That's perfectly okay. And my contention is, is that if you're not willing to get curious about that, then you are going to continue to see the same cycles of hardship and suffering in your life in perpetuity. Like you're, you're just not going to find an exit. And so this conversation is really for people who are looking for that exit. How else could I be experiencing things? What are the pathways for doing that? And this is some of the, the beginnings of ways that we can assess it. It is not the healing work. I want to tell you that, okay? This is ways for you to start creating distinctions in the mind where the mind can separate itself from itself. Meaning, like how many of you guys, when you first started doing personal development, somebody told you or you had the recognition one day suddenly, maybe it even came in an instant, where the you were just having thoughts and then you suddenly had this recognition that you are not the thoughts that are being had you're actually the one that's observing or listening to those thoughts how many guys at some point had that recognition and just say i in the chat box if you have and if you have then you know that was a moment of major revelation for you because suddenly you're like wait a second i'm not all this churning and you really can start creating some separation, right? Between you and this mind that is incessantly talking. And the mind, by the way, like any organ in our body has a function, right? Like we have kidneys and they function for a certain purpose, right? They're like these, uh, uh, <clears throat> anyway, we'll go to every organ, right? We have our liver, we have our lungs and every one of them has a function. Well, the mind is an organ and the mind has a function too. And its function is to help you survive. And it's going to do that by any means necessary with whatever information it got at a very early age. And it's going to do the best it can with that information to keep going. But does that mean that's the absolute best information that's out there for the mind to operate? Again, up for debate, but probably not. There's probably lots of different ways to do things that you haven't thought. Even some really well established things, just because something is super well established, like in science or in spirituality, doesn't necessarily mean that's the best thing ever right? Like we're, we're constantly evolving. We're evolving ourselves. We're evolving society. We're evolving technology. So it would seem weird if one idea just stuck around forever, even the idea of gravity, right? This is, it's constantly evolving. So we want to, we want to get into alignment with that. Like ideas evolve, we can evolve with them. And there may be some feeling of tension in the body and in the mind as you even get curious about something that's outside of your realm of knowledge or experience. That's just natural, okay? So coming back to this idea of safety, it's that fundamentally we're all kind of um, 
built around trying to grasp at this. And so if we try to do this from the mind, and if we try to do this through this uh, agreement-based reality where everybody thinks and feels and acts the same, I don't know about you guys, but if I just assess it from there, I'm like, what's the likelihood of everyone coming to agreement on something based on our history? I would say that's highly unlikely, even improbable, maybe impossible, right? And so if that's the case, and we start seeing us doing this in our own lives, and I'm as guilty of anybody, right? Like when uh, an idea that I have that I'm, I really believe in gets challenged, like all this stuff comes up in my system. And my first response wants to be like, hey, that's, that's not the way of it. Like you have to see it my way. You have to think about it like me. Don't you feel what I'm going through, right? And it's taken quite a bit of training on my part to recognize how invaluable like not valuable responding that way is it's a huge amount of energy to take out of your own system and give to another person. It yields little to no results. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I've never been pervy to a conversation where I'm sitting at a table with somebody. We get into a really heated debate. We have a conversation, maybe even argue about something, maybe even yell about something. And at the end, the other person's like, you know what guy, I'm so happy we did that. Like, your opinions are now my opinions. Thank you very much for enlightening me. Like, hoorah, you know, let's, and, and they go on about their lives and, and, and everything is, is great between us. Like, it doesn't work that way. So you, you want to start recognizing, like, people put a lot of time and effort. Again, go on any social media comment box where people are talking about anything controversial. Certainly, we have plenty of that over the last two years, but that's not new to social media. And you will see, like, how much time and effort people give to that. My curiosity is for, for people who are doing that, even if you're guilty of it, I've been guilty of it in my life as well. If you're doing that 20, 30, 40 minutes a day, I don't know what that works out to in a year, but I imagine you're probably spending days, potentially weeks out of every year of your life in contentious environments doing that with underneath it all, the fundamentals is I'm just trying to get safety to my system. And if that's not bringing safety into your system, like, could you be doing something else at that time? And what are those practices? Okay. So I'm going to just tell you some of the fundamentals here of like, why we kind of flip this stuff on its head. Because, yeah, it's really important to recognize how the mind works and the traps that it pulls you in. And then you get to assess like, okay, what's my trade off for doing this? Am I actually getting anything in return? for putting my energy and time into this thing, because your, your energy is the most important asset that you have, all right? Like you're not going to get this time back. It's the most valuable asset that you have. Your energy is, is basically your currency, like your, your human currency. And it's like, so, you know, we, I know in America, and I'm sure this is true for most parts of the world, like you can vote all you want in government, but you really want things to change, vote with your money. Like you want to see different products come on the market. You want to see healthier foods come on the market. Like companies are always going to follow suit where the money is. So like we, as people, we get to vote with our currency and that's probably the, the most valuable vote that you have, right? So like your currency is also your energy. And if you're putting your energy into things that yield no results, but you keep doing that over and over again, be mindful. Like that's not actually bringing you a result. So how do we actually develop safety in the system? Okay, well, the first thing is, again, we talked about this mirroring aspect of how we take our own identity, we put it on other people, and then we see parts of ourselves and aspects of ourselves in the people that we meet every single day. And we can start using these people as our greatest teachers because every time you're in an interaction with somebody that creates anxiety, uh, disorientation, um, anger, anything in your system that, that is, you know, quote unquote, not pleasurable, you're, you can train yourself to start having gratitude for that individual for being your teacher in that moment, because they are actually highlighting a part within your system that you've turned away from. And now they are cluing you in that there's an opportunity to turn to it. Okay. And the way that we turn to it is not by assessing it, is not by demanding something of it. Cause if it doesn't work out here, thinking, acting, and feeling the same, you're not going to convince this part that reality is any other way than it believes that it is. That, that's why this part is there. That's what trauma is. It is literally a part of you that is stuck in time with a belief and it doesn't want to be told 
that it's not that way because it has used that identity to survive. And because it has survived, it continues to believe that this is the only way to survive. And so if you take that away from it or you try to convince it differently, you're actually creating threat in your own system and you're creating more anxiety and pressurization. And how many of you guys have been in the situation where you're not feeling well, but as you look into your system, you're actually just creating more anxiety and pressurization in your system. This is why. Because you're trying to force it to change. You're trying to have it resolve itself, to go away, to not integrate, to not be part of you. How many of you guys are guilty of something like that? Okay. And so we want to really start understanding, like, how does this mechanism work? Like, what, what's really going on here? Because you guys can potentially really enjoy what I'm saying here. And like, philosophically, you're like, oh, yeah, I get that guy. Like, that is, that is how things work for me. And okay, good. Like, and that basic knowledge or that basic understanding can give you some awareness. Like, don't get me wrong. It's better to be aware of those aspects of ourselves. So when you notice that you're in it, you can at least say, you know what? I actually don't want to do that. I know it doesn't work for my benefit. And I know it doesn't work for their benefit or society's benefit. And I'm, I'm not committed to that. I'm actually committed to a, a peaceful and easeful society. So I'm not going to contribute to that through my action right now even though I might be furious, like you could still be angry and you could still be sad. You could still be anxious and choose not to take an action, not to participate. Okay. And the real win here is by going inside of your system. And so I want to remind you guys, because we, we talk about this often, is that when you're in a situation, what the mind is responding to is not really what's out here. It's really what's in here. Like when, when we go and do experiences, like and when I say we, I mean anybody, when you put your money towards something and you do any kind of experience, you're really not doing it for this, right? Like this is perceiving how it's happening, but you're doing it because the way it makes you feel, right? Like we get into relationships because we're not like, mm, well, this is a really uh, practical situation for me to be in. This uh, partner seems fantastic and what a future we're going to have. You're like, no, you're in love. And there's this feeling in your body and you're like, I, I want to be around a person that, that has me feel this way. I want to continue to have this feeling, grow into this feeling, right? Even if we, we can't sustain it, like there's still that, that, that desire when we go on vacation, when whatever it is that you do, when you thrill seek, when, you know, whatever it might be, right? You do it for a feeling. And so I want to remind you that like, you probably value your feelings above anything else. Even think about when you're in a, a discussion with your partner and you guys May, you know, something happens and you don't feel good, like you start lowering the value of your partner because you're like, oh, my feelings are hurt, right? Because you, you value those feelings probably above anything else in the world. But we don't actually live that way. We, we, we think we, we're like in a thinking world. We've developed a thinking world. So we don't even notice that what we really value is, is down here. And so I want you to realize that when, when the life is coming at you, this is like stimulus, and this body that we have, this thing we call the body, is responding to that stimulus. Okay? And it's creating some kind of sensation. Okay? And now this sensation can be pleasant or unpleasant. And in either case, our mind is watching what's occurring here at the level of sensation. And it's either trying to avoid it or it's trying to get more of it. So it's either trying to like avoid it or have some greed about it and trying to create more of it. And in either case, doesn't matter which one of those you, you, you do, you are going to end up suffering about that thing. It's like Buddhism 101, right? You either try to avert it or you have greed and you attach to it. And in either case, eventually there's going to be some sort of suffering, right? And so oftentimes when positive things in our life are happening, we don't see, because again, we got our, our rosy sunglasses on, that there is some negative aspects to it. And in the same token, when, when something really bad is happening in our lives, we often don't see that there are many positive aspects to it that's actually contributing to our life. And so we, we tend to live on one or the other. And we're oftentimes pointing here that finding center is not a point between those two. It's actually the inclusion of both. It's the infinity symbol. Right. So center is actually when you include both, you live in a both and type of mindset, both and within your body, you're going to find this centeredness inside your system. That's no that's trying not to keep things at bay. It's also not trying to really attach itself to anything. And the way that we can get here, it's it's going to sound very simple because it is. And even though it's simple, it requires a lot of practice on your part. OK, 
What we really want to start noticing, especially for you guys who are newer here, and especially if you've done a lot of the mindset work and you're highly developed in this part, you understand how distinctions work, you know how to reframe, you know how to restory, you know how to do all those things, and yet you're still really frustrated with something in your life, or you don't like the way that business is going, or your health, or your relationships, this is probably what you're missing, is you're missing this other aspect of, of learning how to look into your body. Like, how do you actually look at what's happening here in a way that cultivates reintegration of the parts? Okay, so again, I want to remind you, there's a stimulus coming at your body. Something is happening, like a tightening or an opening, a pressurization or an expansion, right? It can, it's, it, there's some contrast here. And the mind is looking down and it's constantly in this like vigilant, almost hyperactive, like meth head type of experience. And it's assessing what's occurring. Okay. And it has some kind of judgment about that. And then already has from all these traumatic parts that we have, it already, that hijacks a system and it runs a program and it, and it has run it and it's run this program so seamlessly that you don't even notice that it's doing it. It's just, it's just the knee jerk reaction. It's just the knee jerk reaction. So what we can clue into, you know, of course we can sit there and assess, but like I said, what happens when we assess, we often create more pressurization and anxiety in the system. And the anxiety starts rising because we feel like we need to fix it or resolve it or understand it away instead of, and I'll do this now, instead of dropping into our body and bringing awareness there. And I'll teach you guys how to do this in just a moment. And then I'll check if you have any questions. Dropping into our body and actually starting to connect to what are the actual sensations happening in my body, okay? And the reason that we do this, and again, I'll give a prime example of how to do this in just a second here. The reason that we do this is the same reason that an upset child comes to a mother or a father. You can't reason, like I, I, my, my son just turned three, five days ago, okay? I can't reason with him, period. Have you ever tried reasoning with a two or a three-year-old? It doesn't work. The logic part of the brain hasn't even turned on yet. So anytime when my son does something, like yesterday, he broke a glass on the floor, like he, he pulled a piece of paper, it fell. And I asked him why he did that. And his answer is always, I don't know. Now, as an adult, I can get really upset because I want him to justify why he did that action. And I did get a little upset, to be honest. It, like it, it upset me. He kind of, we had a hard day yesterday. And it, and I want him to justify, like, tell me why he did that. And he's like, I don't know. Now that, that starts upsetting my system because I want rationale. I want us to come to an agreement. I want for us to think and feel and act the same way so that I can feel safe, right? That doesn't work for him though. His nervous system is now in a hyperactive state because something happened that created fear in his body, like a, some energy hit his body. Now he's coming to mom and dad, to me and, and his mom, because he needs help down-regulating his nervous system. And the way that a child down-regulates their nervous system is by getting an attuned presence from mom or dad. So if I'm all up here, I'm not attuned. Okay. There's no attunement here. This is just my programs, my conditioning. Now looking at my son, trying to get my conditioning to work on my son. Doesn't work. There's an immediate pushback when that happens. And that's, and that was some of what was happening yesterday. And he started becoming, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? What looks like defiance, right? Like he, a three-year-old doesn't really know how to be defined, but to an adult, it's like, oh, they're being defiant, right? So that's what it looked like from my perspective. I'm, cer I'm certain that's not how it was going for him. Now, as I tuned into my own programs and how I was trying to fix the situation, uh, because of the training, I have some awareness. I'm like, okay, I'm not in my body. He's not feeling me. He's not getting connection from me. So I start tuning into my heart, becoming aware of my heart, putting awareness in my belly, and I'm really becoming aware of my center channel. So there is like a, a hereness to it. And when you do this work, when you do some energetic work, it's very easy because humans learn by contrast. And so you can take your energy way out and disperse it and be with a person. And that person's going to be like, I don't feel you. It feels like a hollow space. Then you bring your awareness in, you bring it into the center channel and you start occupying this space. And the, there's a fullness that comes along with this. And I'm actually transmitting this as I share this as well. So if you're sensitive, you may notice some shifts even here as we talk. There's a fullness that happens. And then within a few minutes, I will start seeing my son like down-regulating, calming down, and coming back to being a sweet little boy. 
Okay. So I say this because it's, un, it's prudent for adults to understand that that works for a child. Okay. And just because you're an adult now and you're in a bigger body doesn't mean that your nervous system and your energetic body and your mental body stopped working that way. The way that it worked when you were a child is the exact way that it works right now. And in order to heal parts and reintegrate them back in, just like when a child gets upset and needs its mom and dad, you may not have your mom and dad anymore, but here's the thing. You are both now the child and the adult. You have these two aspects of yourself, right? The child is the demanding. I want, I want, I want, I want, I need this now, right? It's the thing that, that gets really, really upset. And then you have this like pragmatic adult that can also be developed into this really expansive view. And as you develop the adult into a higher awareness state, it knows you can actually teach it how to reconnect with your, with your own inner child in an attuned, attuned energetic way. And that's what we teach um, in our intuitive mind program and our L1 and L2 programs. It's all about how to go into higher states of consciousness that are outside of this conditioning that we've, that we've all been brought up and lived in for thousands of years now. And it's not until you find this higher awareness state that you can go back in and truly reconnect with this child and teach yourself, teach your own nervous system how to downregulate. And when we do that, the byproduct is more safety. When the byproduct is more safety, what we have is less judgment. When we have less judgment, we have more easeful, peaceful existence. And then you can actually create and manifest your life from that energy. And we remind people here time and time again, it's that the, the actions that you're taking in your life matter a lot less than the energy from which they're being sourced. Okay, so the actions in your life matter a lot less than the energy from which they're being sourced, which is to say, source your actions from a high quality energy. And you are going to see amazing things happen in your life, hands down, in your health, in your relationships, in your business and finances. Like you guys know, right? Like when you're in a shitty mood, it's like everything is swirling, everything is getting bad, everything becomes harder. When you're up and in a flow state and this really beautiful energy, it's like you have the, the Midas touch. So we want to cultivate a practice that allows us for to live in a much higher frequency, a much higher state of energetic consciousness and fluidity so that we can be sourcing everything from our life from this ease and peaceful state. And so that actually creates more ease and more peace in our lives, whatever that might look like for you. You're just going to see that it generates more of that. Okay. So that's kind of the crux of what I want to share today. But again, really simple for you guys who are, who are newer. And you're hearing this idea of like dropping into your body, like that might be a new concept for you, maybe not, but it could be. So I just want, I just want to give you again, a short practice here, and then I'll take the last few minutes and look if we have any questions. If you haven't dropped a question and you do want to ask me a question, feel free to put it in the chat box. But just for a moment here, if you want to uh, play and, and get curious about your awareness, we're going to do a little test run. Uh, with your awareness and you can start actually feeling this immediately in your body and then of course like if you want to start doing some of the deeper work and how to actually connect to these parts and get into resolution not just coping and managing uh, you know my invitation is come do some of the work that we do here so uh, we always do the little the little hand demo so uh, if you wouldn't mind just put like your right hand up next to you like this and what I'm going to have you do is instead of looking at your hand with your eyes, the eyes create an object object reality. It, the, the optical ends of eyes automatically separate objects, right? Create distinctions. So you will notice though, that even though your eyes might be open, it might be helpful to close them. If you need them, try it both ways. What I'm going to ask you to do is to become aware of your hand. Just become aware of your hand. And I want you to notice first that awareness is not contingent upon your eyes. There's another way that you become aware of things. Like you can just as easily close your eyes and still be aware of the hand without looking at it at all. And what I want you to start noticing about your hand as you put awareness on your hand is what's actually happening to your hand, what's actually happening within your hand. And so usually people report like they start feeling tingling in their hand or heat or coolness or like a tickling. And so would it be fair to just take all those things and just say that what we're feeling 
is increased sensation in our hand. And you can write in the chat box if you are feeling increased sensation in your hand. Okay. And so just as quickly, try the other hand. Like now move awareness from this hand to this hand. Notice how fast it is. We call that the speed of awareness, which is faster than the speed of light. And then start noticing that if putting awareness on this hand is increasing sensation in this hand. Okay, so again, however it is, heat, cooling, tingling, tickles. And so what's happening? Why are we feeling more sensation in this hand than we were just a moment ago? So I'm sure you've all heard this line where, where, where attention goes, energy flows, or where awareness goes, energy flows. That's exactly what's happening, actually. We are using this intuitive awareness. And I want you to notice that I didn't tell you how to use your awareness. You knew how to do that intuitively. Every human does. And as we put our awareness here, what happens is awareness, wherever awareness sits, the chi or energy starts collecting. And that's what you're feeling as that increased sensation of the energy. And then chi has this other beautiful byproduct that when we continue to build the chi, chi will actually pull more blood flow up towards that area. So that could be why you're starting to feel the heat. It's actually the blood that's moving towards the energy. And if you've ever heard um, like a yogi who can heal themselves faster, this is how they're doing it. They're, they're very intentional with where their awareness is. And so you lay or you orient the awareness to the part of the body that may have the injury. You're bringing energy to it, and then there's more blood flow, which is bringing more nutrients and sustenance to that part. And so, of course, the body can heal faster in this way. Okay. And so now from your hand, again, just try and move it again. Move it towards your left foot. See how that feels. And see, again, if what you're looking for is, am I feeling more sensation wherever I bring my awareness? And so there you go. You probably start feeling some more energy in that left foot. Try the right foot. And so why is this important? Like why, why is this an important thing to learn? And hopefully even that little demo is um, eye-opening or reveal something to you. So why is this important? Because most of us, again, are living from this conditioned mind, okay? And there is this whole world of subtle energy that our body is constantly experiencing, attuning to, and trying to inform our mind of. But our mind, because we don't really tune into the sensation, all we really notice is the thoughts that we're having, pleasant or unpleasant. That's pretty much where everyone's living. Underneath all that is this whole other subtle reality that's occurring of energy, energy and expansion, okay? And so with awareness, what you will notice is that when you are in moments, of elation or you are in moments of despair that there is something happening in your biomechanical suit this body right there's something there's some expression of, it, of what's happening usually that feels like a, a tightening or like some kind of a jabbing pain or a pressurization or like a pinching or like a almost like a spike like a like a nail is in there like something like a sharp pain of some kind and it's and it can be from really obvious to rather subtle right like if i bonk you on the head yeah, my head, that's going to be really obvious. And notice too, until I hit you in the head, you don't even, you barely even notice that you have a head. It's only when we have sensation that we notice something. Otherwise it's, it's as if the head doesn't even exist because I am not the head. I am the awareness that is now localized here behind the eyes with what I call the head, but we can localize our awareness anywhere. And that's really what this training is about is, is the first is realizing you don't have to stay up here. You don't have to localize your awareness here. There you are so easily localizing your awareness in your hand, noticing a response in your biomechanical suit and noticing that you're actually driving and collecting energy by doing that. That's huge. Most people aren't even aware of this, okay? And the other aspects is we were talking about trauma and judgment, healing, safety, right? All this aspects and how coming to a child who is upset with a parent with awareness helps them to downregulate their system and feel more easeful and peaceful. So 
It would come to pass then, and I'm telling you from personal experience and how this works and having trained tens of thousands of people, that when we learn how to gently place our awareness in the part of the body that's having the experience of some pain or disconnection or loneliness or wherever it might be, we are then retraining this part of our body, just like we were retraining, just like we're training the little boy or little girl. And in my example, we are retraining this part in our body. Number one, that it's safe to be here to reintegrate into the system. Number two, we're helping it downregulate itself, which basically lets it go of whatever um, identity it has, whatever viewpoint it has, and just reintegrate back into the whole. Okay. So when that process is complete, when we put enough awareness there, when we bring presence to it and it downregulates and reintegrates into the system, what that ends up what ends up happening is that when the next time something in your environment that looks like something that would normally upset you hits the system, the part that was all by itself getting really upset and then hijacking the system no longer does that. It's already reintegrated back into the system. And so you don't have this big expression this like compression or, or whatever, you know, expression that may have had, it's no longer needed. The body has already, has already cultivated safety and ground and it no longer needs to have that response. And that to me in Elon, that's what healing is. It's when a part is reintegrated, the stimulus happens. And for you, it's like, hmm, okay. You know, like you guys all know people where like one person's going to freak out if that situation happens and another person won't, that's not anybody's fault. The one that does and the one that doesn't, that is just how their system organized. You know, you flip the situation and maybe something else happens. Like maybe for one person, it's like they lose a relationship and that really destroys them. Um, maybe for another person, it's the a loss of income that really destroys them. Right. And, and for one other person that doesn't do anything at all. And so like, why do people have these different expressions? It's really just what they experienced when they were little and then how their system responds to that. You are not in control of that. You are not in control of the way that your system responds. Like, when you meet, you know, the person that finally makes you feel like all this expression of love, like you weren't in control of that. It just, it just flowered. It just happened. When you get upset, you don't sit there and go, okay, now is the moment I'm going to get really upset. Let me do it. It just unfolds. It arrives. It just happens. You can't control that. So to waste your time in trying to understand it, thinking by having enough understanding, you're going to control it. You're not. You're going to still do it. And when you come down from it, you'll be like, oh, I understand why I did that. And that'll be it. Or you'll be in the middle of it. And that, and because you're in the middle of it and you understand that the payoff sucks, maybe you won't go as far with it. And you'll be like, you know what? I'm done and walk away from that situation. But it still doesn't resolve it. You're still managing and you're coping in that aspect of yourself. So what I'm showing you guys here is a simple example of where we can bring awareness to these aspects of ourselves from a higher state of consciousness with a certain quality of attunement. And that's what we teach is how to get into the higher states and how to get into that attunement. And when you do that, help this aspect of you come back to ground and safety so that it doesn't hijack the system anymore. And the more that you do this and the more that you cultivate this and the more that you practice this, the easier that it gets, the more enjoyable that it gets, by the way, there is a appreciation in doing this. It's not like a you know, like when you do personal development, we say it's a, it's a really fun ride up, then it kind of plateaus, then it's like kind of gets boring because it's the same old, same old. And you, you don't really feel like there's much more you can do because there's only so much we can understand about how our man mechanism works. There's only so many times you can look at a moment of trauma and assess it differently than you did before. Like, you know, if your mom did something to you at five years old and you've been intensely looking at that for 10 years Okay, great. So you found a different way to look at it, but like, how does that really help you from having that response in your body? It's still going to arise. And so the only way that we have found is to, first of all, stop trying to remove it from yourself and start looking at how do I reintegrate this within myself and resolve it in such a way that helps my nervous system respond better from like a more balanced, grounded place next time that stimulus occurs in my life, because the stimulus will continue to come. That's just what's so. Okay. All right, guys. Um, let me look real quick if there's any, any quick questions here. Otherwise I'll make a, a final announcement. Okay. And if there is any last bits, I mean, we're coming up here on time. So let me, let me just give you guys the, 
the announcement. Again, I want to remind you um, that if you are looking to participate in any of the work that we do, uh, by far for me, like what I would do if I was in anybody's shoes that want to, wants to get an introduction into what we do here is come join our level one program. Uh, that's our mindset and emotional mastery program level one. And that will just give you um, a, a, a big dive into the deep pool of what this work is all about. And then you can assess from there whether you want to continue uh, doing this kind of work with us or not. What's really amazing about that work is it's, it's within reach and very affordable to just about everybody. And it also includes an incredible curriculum that we used to sell at close to $5,000. Now it's nowhere near that price point, it's just a few hundred dollars. Um, and it also includes six weeks of live group coaching. And it hits on many of the aspects that I talked about how to uh, start shifting the way that the mind works, understanding how it works. And the reason you want to do that is you really want to create a foundation of, of like, how do I get off the ride when I'm on the ride? That's the most important part. It's not like you do, like I've never met a human being that can just get off the ride. Okay. We want to be able to recognize being on that ride and then getting off as soon as we can. And then going into practices that allow us to establish more safety and ground in the system and using every time that an upset happens in our life, not as a woe is me moment, but as a woo, an opportunity for doing this work that helps re-establish connection with our nervous system and down-regulating it. And so in level one, we do both of these. Now, again, I want to remind you that come January 1st, uh, that program is going to be twice the cost. So uh, this is a, an incredible opportunity for you guys to come in and give yourself a, a holiday gift. Or if there's a loved one that you know that will get value from this work, please let them know and tell them. And then the other thing is right now, we only accept people into these programs through an application process. It's not a long one. It's very easy. It's only going to take you like three, four, five minutes to fill out our application. Then you get on a quick phone call uh, with someone from our team, our concierge service. We'll get on a clarity call with you. And again, it's just to make sure that you're here for the right reasons. Um, and, and we want to certainly you want to find out if we're a good fit for you. Well, we also want to find out if you're a good fit for us. OK, so it's like a, a mutual agreement that uh, we're coming to together and saying this does feel like a good fit, like any relationship. You're going to get a ton of value from this work. And then, of course, right, I'm not telling you there's a hidden agenda. There's an agenda that if you enjoy this work, you get to come and participate and continue in other work if you feel called to doing that. The other advantage of doing uh, L1 is that you actually get a a two uh, sorry a free ticket to our two day live intensive, and the next one's in mid mid January uh, on its own if you want to, but it's already included with L1 and L1's only a few hundred dollars more than the ticket, so you might as well get two for the price of one here. So I highly highly recommend again if you want to participate in this work, you want to uh, grow not just into your uh, mindset and growth work. You also want to do the waking up work, learn how to resolve these aspects inside the system, not just how to cope and live with them and understand them better, but really get into the uh, reintegration part. Then level one is by far the uh, the best game in town. So if you head over to soulsandseekers.com forward slash apply, it'll take you right over to the uh, application page. It'll take you just a, a few minutes to apply there. Uh, fill out the application and then schedule a time to speak with either uh, Nikki or Corey from our team. And they're amazing. Again, anybody who's done a work has always been connected to those guys. They are um, valued members of our community. They're love, love, love supporting you guys. They love hearing all the transformative stories and everything here. And so that's your, uh, your foot in the door. I hope you enjoyed today's training. Uh, I love you very much. Um, holidays are just around the corner, Thanksgiving here in the States and elsewhere. So wherever you are, I hope you're uh, traveling safe and uh, enjoy the time with family and friends. We love you very much. Thank you for being part of this ride and part of our family uh, over this year. We have a lot of cool new stuff coming in the uh, new year. So again, uh, thank you for being here and uh, we'll talk to you soon. See you next time. Bye, everybody.